How do I define vernacular comedy? Vernacular comedy show it's fire then. Eh? When they mean lit, it's lit. It's on another level. English comedy is in the future of vernacular comedy. Vernacular comedy, it's a way of living as a black person in a funny world. It's a big burst of energy. That's a celebration. Rolling on the floor. They literally do that. In South Africa, there's like 11 languages. Most of them are vernacular. Imagine living in a country where most people look like you and no comedy sounds like you. 60% of the population cannot understand English. It's not that they're laughing at what you're saying, they're laughing at themselves. Because they see bits and bits of their life. You don't have to explain much, so you just get into it and kill. Oh, thank you for screaming as I was dancing. I was trying to shake off the nervousness. I always get nervous whenever I have to perform in English. I, I knew that when I grow up, me and English, we will never. I don't understand what kind of language is this. You learn a language for 13 years and you are still being introduced to new words. How many Englishes do you have? You know, I'm not going to do accents. I don't think it's hilarious. He, we, uh, yeah, because he said whack instead of work. He's trying to learn your language, fuckers. You never learned his. No one ever laughed you and, ha it's the way you say Kunjani. <laughs> <laughs> this whole language thing is tough, man. We've got 11 official languages. 11 official languages, right? 11. 37 indigenous languages. 11 official languages, which can be very scary. If you're white. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. English is a very stupid language, people. Yeah. The normal called Topsy. The Soweto is is one city that uh, it's it's so it's so pointed in negativity. But when you actually live in it and stay in it, you'll understand why most people are doing crime, uh, why most people are, are, are living like this in poverty. Anything that I've experienced that hurt me, I want to put humor in it. That's how I, I heal myself. Instead of spending so much money to go see a therapist, mm -mm. I'd rather therapize myself already. Ah, never. Can't afford you guys. Mm, therapist. <laughs> if ever you want the, the easy way out, then obviously you want to fall into the crime base type of thing. And then if ever you, you want to work hard for yourself, you end up owning a business. But if ever you want a stable life, you'll end up seeking out and being driven. So that's why I've decided I want to be driven. I want to do something that has never been done. That's why I'm the only comedian we have in Top Symbol. And Topsonville is the biggest sector we have in Soweto. I'm, I'm a free spirit person when it comes to my neighborhood. And I help out, I help out a lot. I'm a, I'm a member of, a, of the community uh, police forum, basically. Uh, when I'm not working or not doing the gigs at night, I wear this reflecting jacket, uh, night reflecting jacket, and watch guard the, the neighborhood. Uh, that's me. Zwaga. Yeah, this is this, this one of the, of the guys who grew, grew up under me. They don't call me a brother, they call me a friend. I don't care about that. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't party, he went to a club last night. <laughs> That's what you call papalas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was doubting to come because he knew I'm going to say something funny about him. <laughs> as, much, as much as we can say more, more things about this, can I, can I tell you something? We can have fun, we can make fun of everyone and anyone, including in the industry and politics and whatnot. But uh, most people, they forget the history that we come from. And so, before I call our, our headline act, I want us to celebrate the history that we have as black people in South Africa. I was born in 84, right? Right after the saga of 76, where a student died. When we were born in the 80s, 70s, we we'll go, we'll go to jail. We survived apartheid. Yeah. 
you understand, ama. But it took so about us, ama, 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 eighties, ama seventies. With my parents, I wonder what were, were they thinking during that apartheid era. They had time to even make me, you know. So I had to find humor in it instead of me expressing it in pain. Instead of us talking about, yeah, apartheid, hey, why to what? No, 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 I need to say it in a more funny way that will relate with my parents. I even asked them one time before I even did that job, I'm like, do you realize that, guys, when you were busy making me and my sister, they were taking a smelling around you and you were busy making us. And my terror was like, uh, 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 don't you dare say that to us. <laughs> when they said no, I realized that it's going to be funny. <laughs> Getting gigs is quite difficult in Soweto as a comedian. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I ready for a headline act, ladies and gentlemen. No, 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 no. Remember, it works with energy. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for a headline act for tonight? All the way from Eastern Cape. I didn't choose to be a comic. I believe art chooses. Before you become an artist, during your time trying to learn the craft and understand it, it, it tests you. Uh, it puts you under challenges where it's, it's slowly grooming you to become a fully grown artist who can be able to put pictures in your artwork. People watch other comics from America and they think comedy is easy and think comedy is all about making people laugh. You need to be speaking about issues that affect black people. Speak about the community on stage, that's when people can relate. This is the only comedian tonight who got called back on stage. He was requested like, come back, come back. And he came back. <laughs> I grew up in a black community without me being aware that there are these kind of uh, segregations and, and stuff like that. I, I was already in front of Kosa people and, and engaging with them in my language. Here's the thing, when you grow up in a village, Eastern Cape, you grow up thinking that this is all that is in the village. You think that you're going to grow up, probably have your own house in the village and have a wife, have kids, own two dogs, have a couple of cows, sheep, work, have a car, and then that's it. So now, there's a time where it clashes to what you grew up being taught and to what you are experiencing as a person outside the village. Right now, I do have a joke about kind of like the history of South Africa. The only thing was said, because mentally, she thinks that the apartheid era is a and the injury is higher. Into your silent meetings is a comrade. So during the day, we are going to zoom up at the beginning of the Because of Mandela, but I paid him a part of the meeting. So the town called us Babona, but it's not exactly my comrade. I pray to the joy in our world. The reason I wrote the joke is when I see in my communities that there are certain people who are still stuck in that they believe that we are still in the apartheid era, of which in, in one way or another, it's still true. Step on stage, audience probably a thousand other black people, and you talk about this, and you find that probably 80% of these people understand and relate. So it puts a different type of healing in you, you understand, and, and them too. And they relate to what she's talking about on stage, and they kind of like, oh, so I'm not the only one. Was that 
Barack and Joe Blake. Why not do such things at once? My focus is not to conquer Joe Blake. It means changing the landscape of comedy in, in, in Eastern Cape, in Vanak. I used to be a preacher back in the days. I used to stand on the pulpit and preach the word of God. Comedy is a spiritual thing. I'm a storyteller. I talk about my experience. I can say I'm a motivational humorist. You know, like, as a female comedian, you have to fight twice as hard to be recognized. You know, I hate putting labels on things. I don't like labeling things at all. And I always tell people that, don't say I'm a, I'm a veneg comedian. I'm not a veneg comedian. I'm not a female comedian. I'm a comedian. That's all. That's why even when they introduce you on stage, they would say, the next comedian is a female. These people have eyes, they will see me. Why must you, why are you preparing them for me, the female? Uh, do you think I'm gonna splash them with my periods, eh? Why put a label on me? Yeah, I'm circumcised today to raise to my slow. You need to be a rebel to do this thing. circumcision, it's a no-go area for women. But then, when the Department of Health says, when you sleep with a man who is not circumcised, you get cervical cancer. Can you see that it becomes my business now? So the secret is to capture them. You can't just rock on stage and then say, circumcision, no. Talk about something, make fun of uh, other things, make them laugh, and as they are laughing, then, Anyone can be funny talking about sex. Anyone. It is not something that I say the minute I get on stage until I leave. Of course I will have sex jokes because I... I've had sex once upon a time in my life. <laughs> The Hollywood uh, of South Africa. We had to we had to hustle from the big from the ground up so that we can get to play big gigs again. Uh, people like Zico helping us. I thought I knew comedy. I thought I was doing comedy. It was like I'm very confident. Like ah, I got this thing. And then I met this guy. I see him on stage, bring the house down literally. And I was like, okay, boy, you need to go back and like <laughs> chill and, and learn this thing. And, and fast forward three years later, is this is where we are now. Yeah, we are here, big short next to Lupello and my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> That's our life. <laughs> no swimming pool, nothing. You kind of expect how that, like, yo, when I arrive in Joburg, like, I've been doing so much. So probably things are going to just. You know, yeah, well, because you've been working so hard outside and then you arrive here, like you're way back on the food chain. 
Like, like it changes. It's something else. Now you need to kind of like prove yourself. Yeah, I understand. It's like starting, starting, like starting over, all over. Again. Starting all over again. <laughs> Everyone was here. You can literally put them like I in see. a three point <laughs> five or five thousand seater in the Eastern Cape. There's no excuse why we're here. Stuff it's would so be deep, man. Like you're gonna cry. No, <laughs> man. <laughs> The key is to the South African audience uh, here in Joburg. You could do so much in your own province up until you come to Joburg, and that's when things are going to start to change. And here's the beauty about comedy. If you change your focus into winning the hearts of the Elendo's e audience and people, like, you, you appreciate it, that moment, like, this is what I'm living for. Like, imagine 3,500 black people sold out and, and, and you on stage. And, like the laughter feels like it's raining on you. Like it's 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 mm, you can yeah, you can literally yeah, feel yeah, yeah. each and every person just probably even your ancestors are looking at you like yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like your ancestors like, you, like, you, like your ancestors like before everybody claps when you're done with your set your ancestors start a slow clap like yes yes. Yeah. <laughs> South Africa is very segregated. Things haven't changed. They haven't. Even now, you'll still get black people dancing on TV adverts. Like if a black person's selling a product, they're generally singing or dancing. And it's just this racism that invades, that invades like our, our life. We don't live in the same areas. We don't watch the same TV shows. We don't listen to the same music. We don't speak the same languages. We don't have the same political beliefs. Oh, this is electricity, see? <laughs> and we've got toilet paper, uh, water. <laughs> In fact, if you want a drink, here's for Jake, Sam, come here. <laughs> <laughs> so the audiences are generally homophobic, sexist, racist misogynist. It's crazy because those jokes are the ones that seem to hit the hardest. Monte Cassino is a popular uh, entertainment venue for mainly white people, okay? So you come here, you've got to be able to do your comedy in English. You'll see when a black comedian, in fact, there's probably going to be a black comedian on stage now that people are going to love him because he's learned how to entertain his audience. You know, all very well to be able to do comedy at Zulu, but there's a place to do that. Uh, we're all aware of what happened in the past, and I don't think anyone's um, prevented or stopped from doing comedy in their own language. So I don't think there's that same um, issue that runs through entertainment so much. Never ask a Jap what his name is, because he's going to fucking tell you, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> then you're going to try and remember this. So anyway, there he is standing, Mr. Wong said, oh, Mr. Parker. Oh. <laughs> I was getting into stand-up around 1994, which is kind of when th the very early days of things starting to change in South Africa, yeah. I met one of these vendors at the robot, or he could have been a fucking Zulu, I'm not sure. This <laughs> so I walks up the window, he said, hey, boys, buy the Natchez. So I said, bro, no, no thanks. No, the Natchez is nice, look, it's nice. The comedy that I grew up watching was very crammed with stereotypes, uh, pretty misogynist, uh, pretty racist. Now, I don't know why black guys have got a couple of extra inches on a white guy. I don't know why, but I've got a theory. <laughs> I think it's right. I think they need the extra length. Because have you taken a look at the size of black women's asses? I was performing largely in bars to white men, uh, watching white men perform. What's your name? No, no, don't act like you don't fucking speak English now, bro. <laughs> Back in the days, there was no spot for Venek comic. Back in the days, I had to create the Venek platform. It wasn't there before I started speaking my mother tongue. We create our own shows. We create our own gigs. That's what we do. For some people, it's just ugh, one of those indigenous, primitive jokes. That's how they view it. The comedians, not the audience. 
before you can even start performing, they'll give you that look, oh, here he goes again with his mother tongue. I don't think it's going to work. That's why they've created the whole thing of mainstream and Venek. But the Venek comedy pulled bigger crowd than the mainstream. One, two, three, red glasses or one, or one, or one, or the energy level of the audience, it's so amazing. Maybe it's because they haven't been laughing for so long. They've been so oppressed in this country. They just want their peace of mind. They just want to laugh now. If you don't hear what, what we are saying, you are missing out a lot. And I don't think anytime soon we're going to do subtitle for you. You better learn our language. Masha Bela is like a force of nature. I think what he's doing is, is quite revolutionary. When you go to watch Vinak comedy, and, and I'm speaking as someone who's like saying, I don't know what's going on, you can't help but fall in love with the energy. Uh, Masha Bela and I were laughing because when he came to the underground originally, I was like, dude, I think you're very funny, but you're going to have to do English because uh, I, I don't know how to sell this, you know? And then he went and became this king of vernacular comedy. I can't take this anymore. <laughs> you sense the pressure around other comics, the pressure of speaking in English. I don't understand why I should change my language, you understand? While I'm on stage and cater for, for like five people, while probably 300 people here are black, you understand? performing in a white audience. The first time I directly translated the jokes, they didn't land well. And let's all be honest. In the looks department, we are levels. Like, we, we're not the same. Right? Like, you can tell this table over here, like, this morning probably came out of a shower or a bath. Like, you can, you can tell, but over here, you can see if I score. <laughs> you can see if I score this side. Please. Guys, let me, come on, help me, let me try to explain what's a Vasco to, come on, let's, let's, um, you see, a Vasco, it's like a bath, but it's portable. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Vasco. <laughs> I want to take a bath in front of the camera. <laughs> it was very difficult for me at first, uh, performing for white people. And I wanted to do a joke of mine that uh, talks about the cultural norm that we have in Limpopo, where we refer to each other with our totems or family clan names. White people don't have that. So I needed to find a way to tell the joke and make sure that they get exactly what I'm trying to say. Like a clan name is uh, something that they use to praise your, your family. Where I come from, they use animals. It represents the strength of your family. For example, they can say, these are the Chabalalas, and their, their totem is a lion. So when a Chabalala is getting married or graduating, old women ululate and say, ria, 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 a lion is getting married. Eh -eh. So they are proud. They are, they are lions. They are strong. Us, the Mosuetes, ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors, forefathers, sat down and decided that our totem, an animal that is going to represent our strength, is a pig. You know? Yes, yes, yes. I'm Come here, on. guys. I'm here. Stand up comedy because it paid bills. Like, One of the most now. killing questions. Yeah. Like, you're yeah. an artist. That, that you, type you of guys question. Are in comedy, like, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, that's, I, you, you know, yeah, that question hurts, Joe. Like, when someone asks you, what does it pay? Yo, that hurts, Joe. Like, inside, you start to explain, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> the flood. And then hope. And then hope. Yeah. And then hope. Oh, Yo. Get away. Because, yeah, no idea. It looks cheesy mm. from the untrained eye. So yeah. somebody will say, oh, you're a comedian. So now they think you're oh, killing yeah, it. Cloud. Now at home, that's where they're from. Like, Mama will see you busy up and down, mm. you know, 
not getting a job because some of us yeah. artists we don't want to get a nine to five job. Yeah. But then Mama will ask you, hey, where's the money, yeah. Baba? There's no money to be made for lots of these guys. Nothing, zero. Cost them money to get to gigs, to speak in their own language. And they do it without flinching. And they go back and they do it again. For us, people who speak Vanag, it's a, the, the hustle is different. You need to be talented, uh, be your own marketer, be your own accountant, be your own agent. You understand? For you to kind of like really, really break through. Once you speak English, yo, it's way, 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 way different. Like, I haven't met any agents that wants to book or sign a Vanag comic. None at all, I haven't. The only time that they know that you're legit is when they see you on TV. Because now the amount of money we make is the same amount of money that goes back into your venues, uh, transport, food, and stuff like that. And so we don't, we don't really make, we're not really making a living. Sometimes we barely even afford to buy ourselves clothes and stuff like that. We are family and stuff, yo. But we're going to keep on knocking on their doors up until they open. Always, I always, always made sure that I'm always in Tavern every Tuesday. I started hosting because I was voted by some of the comedians. I said, we love your energy, go push. That was five years ago. Ever since, never looked back. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a round of applause for the queen. She started comedy in the Tavern, and now she's hosting in her own shows every Thursdays. Elakari, please, let us give a round of applause. Let us welcome the one and only Bafeti, the beautiful, the gracious. Hey, why not? Hey, what's what? Hey, why not? Inspire. Hey, why not? The queen. Hey, why not? Give us a round of applause. Let's give a round of applause. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, you're a tremendous fire. 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 Oh, you Tavern, basically, Tavern made me. If it wouldn't be for Tavern, I wouldn't be here. Tavern is not, it's not like a place of work, it's more like family for me. Tavern, it, oh, yeah, Tavern, oh. Tavern, you, it's a true meaning of being in a township. It tests your content as a comic because Tavern audience are gonna eat you up. So you need to be real, it's Benak, it's what it is. Well, we didn't have 11 official languages in South Africa. We had English and Afrikaans. So it was after South Africa got uh, the freedom or we got into the democracy that it was decided, okay, fine, every language that is spoken in South Africa will be an official language. But I still feel our people, I don't know how to put it, they, they still don't believe that their home languages are official. It's important because even during the apartheid era, they tried to divide us as black people according to our tribes. If you go to Soweto, sections where people stay, they stay because of certain language that they speak. That's how they manage, they've managed to, to divide black people in South Africa. Most people died on marches where they were marching against being taught in Afrikaans, you understand? So the language has always been a subject when it comes to politics in South Africa. You should learn, white people. Black people, we speak at least three, right? At least three. And we know enough of the other languages to know shit is going down. Because I don't speak Venda, but if I heard, ah, but I mean, the boss is shit, it's shit, it's shit, it's shit, it's shit, it's shit, it's shit, I'm out. I got enough information from that conversation. White guy's still there. It's such a lovely language, it's just, Nice there will come a point where people understand that we have 11 official languages and all of them can be used anywhere, anytime. Afrikaans, Zulu, Kosa. No. Ah! That's as far as I know. <laughs> Is it Kosa? He did. He just called the map. English. Uh, I was going to say obviously, but that's kind of colonial arrogance, isn't it? 
Pedi, Tuana Soto. In the Bele, isn't in the Bele one? At least two of them have got in. Um, I didn't know there was going to be a test, so. Three more, three more, three more. I always have viewers then. All the time. I have this character called Mohaeji. So sometimes when I'm not busy and the person that I shoot with is not busy, we take uh, those videos and then I put them on my YouTube channel. I play this character of a woman. She's rural, but she thinks she's smart. And her husband is just quiet. The husband never speaks. She's controlling. She thinks she's always right. So actually today, we were supposed to shoot with some guy. So the guy didn't come. So I just thought, okay, fine. I'll go have cocktails. I'm the funniest bitch in the world. Your teenage son's bedroom, and every night he will look at me and say, Mama, Mama Mia, I am coming, I'm coming to a comedy show. <laughs> if I was not a comedian, I don't know, I think I'd be missing. <laughs> and funny enough, before she went to do comedy, she was a teacher. Her students were always looking forward to her class. I remember one time she told me the story about, I think they wanted to divide the class. I think it was school, so they wanted to take other kids to someone's class. They want, they almost to it. Do you know what is to do it? Like to go on a strike. Uh, sometimes I meet some of them in town and they say, ah ma'am, you know, we still remember some of the things that you were teaching us because you were giving us funny examples. So it was easy for us to remember because it was funny. So, like, uh, maybe that's why I started my comedy. Although it's funny, but it's educational. I don't think there's a comedy god. I look at life to make jokes. I used to read the, the Bible a lot explaining how God created the heavens and the earth. Comedy is very much like preaching. We tell the truth. We use the stage. Pastors use the pulpit. We use laughter. But at the end of the day, we want to get a point across. It's not everybody who's going to love your work. Some are haters. For real, the men, they, they look at you like they don't believe that you can be funny. But then I stand up and show them what's real. And I sit and watch them. They don't see it coming at all. And then that is the best part when they, they see something that they didn't expect. Linda, let's ladies first. What's up? Hello. That's my daughter, Linda. Who's that? She's very shy. Yeah, I named her after my my late sister. She passed away. <sighs> to, yeah, 2012. Yeah, it was the uh, 6th of May. Hello, mom. Say hello, baby. It's like, oh, this guy. Comedy is not a career for you. For me, yeah, it is. Not for you. <laughs> I've got twins, by the way. This is Linda Woodley. Yeah, my other child. It's your boy. Nah. His name is actually a continuation of my, of my daughter's name. Means um, waiting for beauty. My sister, she's the woman who actually made me to decide to go on stage. 
honestly speaking, because she she passed away. It was a Sunday. I will never forget that day. Um, and then on uh, in October, same year, I started comedy, which was five years ago. So I I wanted to do something that will keep me not thinking too much about her. She she was a pillar. Anytime I needed anything from her, she wouldn't even think twice. I grew up in an abusive home. But I put humor in it so that I don't feel the pain. I'm actually slowly healing myself, not to hate my dad. A couple of months back, I, I was feeling like I miss my sister very much. I did a tattoo after her. She's a Scorpio, so I did a Scorpio tattoo with the death date underneath it. I've never, I've never written jokes about my sister. Nah. Stage, your performer, Pamban. It means you are crazy. You can't be doing that. That's my sister. That's how I, I imagine her. To my mom, she expected something different from, from me. She understands life according to how she was raised. And she was raised like in a place where like where there was no equality around people, where she was raised in farms. Uh, the only way she knows that one can make a living is when you wake up and work, and understand, and then come back later with something to eat. You quit the job for something that she doesn't understand at all. good. Maybe if I was a musician or probably an actor, maybe I stood a better chance, but now I'm a comic. They don't understand. She wasn't happy at all. It was a roller coaster type of situation. First time on the bus to Joburg. See, so I was sitting in the front. I'm sitting alone at the back, having no money at all. The only money I had was to buy the ticket, and that was it. It was all up to God. Everything else was like that. Ah, it's all up to our ancestors. Yeah. That trip, I was wearing a red Nike hood. The same Nike hood I was wearing on my first time on stage. The memories are coming back now, like, yeah, I remember it came. Just the knowledge that, listen, this person has come here to watch my show. Who, who would that person be? It would have been my mom, but I've been stopping her for years, but not. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why though? No, the reason for that is, is because I want her to watch me when I'm kind of like on a huge platform. She doesn't know stand-up. So the first time she has to meet stand-up is when it's in a bigger platform. It's more like, uh, you know, when, you have, when you're in love with someone and you don't want your family to meet while as a not matured yet. Yeah. You understand? You can't introduce your girlfriend to your family <laughs> while she's still in a kind of like building phase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You let her mature, get educated, they will, when she's on her own, that's when you like, ta-da, when your son is in control of some shit. Yeah. <laughs> so now, this year, she's going to meet stand-up. Uh, and stand-up is going to meet my mom. And they're both going to live happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chief. So yeah, this year is the year. I feel like I'm about to give birth. Oh.
Oh, I'm about to walk down the aisle. I don't know. I've got mixed feelings, guys. I got a call from Ryan. But then what surprised me was when he sent me an SMS with his email address. It was at Trevor Noah. And I, that's when I got confused because I know at Gmail, at Hotmail, at Yahoo. Why is it at Trevor Noah? Why is it at him? He called me again. You made it on the lineup of Trevor Noah's Nationwide comedy and it's gonna be recorded for TV. Like a whole episode is going to be dedicated to you. A, a whole episode, it's not like, welcome on stage, whoever. Welcome on stage, no go, welcome. No, it's welcome on tonight's episode of Trevor Noah's Nationwide with Nuku, just Nuku, just, just Nuku, just me. I don't know if I even make sense right now, but. <laughs> Trevor Noah. <laughs> I'm telling you. I want tonight to be special, and it's gonna be. I we were in the same class since grade eight. We were kids. We're nerds. We're he was a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> he was a nerd. Zika used to wear glasses. People don't know this. Was a mm, nerd. You have to say that, man. Guys. In the morning, they used to take our books. If the police would come and say, hey, where's your book? No, 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 there it is. <laughs> they would take the book and copy everything, you know? I think that's where Zico honed his skill. I've, I've never knew that I was going to be a comedian. You never knew? I never knew I was going to be a comedian. I knew. I was not funny, though. <clears throat> I, was, <laughs> I was just a nerd. Nerds are funny. Books. Because they talk about some things that we don't understand. <laughs> and then they force you to understand the things that you don't understand. I normally don't write my jokes when I perform. Never written jokes. So what I do, I freestyle. I, I, I think on my feet. I get a call. Dude, the same jokes you were telling that person on stage on Tuesday. Hey, a certain person was saying the same thing you were doing on Tuesday night. It's happening not only to me, but to every comedian. But when it's happening to me, it's actually killing my spirit. I don't want to lie. It's killing my spirit. But at the same time, it's like, dude, you're doing something that somebody is seeing treasure in it. So keep, keep pushing that treasure. Uh, at the end of the day, it will come back to you. When I call comedians, like, look, I've made it this far. You can come and join me. You can surpass me. It's OK. but. As long as you understand that I took you through the journey. I'm not rushing to 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 to, to be well known in the game, but I'm just taking as it, as it comes. So that the more I build about myself, the better I pick up. You got that. I'm the only lady on the lineup. Therefore, this dressing room, because I'm the only lady, is mine. Simple mates. I was never good at mates, but I know these things. Maybe blue? Dark blue? Yeah. Okay. Dark blue? Yeah. Fun color. Mm -hmm. I opened with my mother being the loudest woman. Is that a joke? Lazy girl. Really? Yeah, I love that joke. You know, all my jokes are here. That's the problem. That's yeah, the, I have that problem in my life. That's the point. I'll make them laugh. Now the problem is stopping them from laughing. But they laugh the whole 15 minutes and I said only one joke, Ryan. Oh. I need to tell them more. So they must just Please laugh when they get home. They must laugh when they get home. You see my problem now, right? Yeah. A lot of killer gets. My life. Mm. Yeah, rather too many than not enough. 
English comedy is no longer the sort of big, you know, the big news. Uh, Vernac comedy has kind of exploded and mushroomed out. And I think vernacular comedy is by far the most exciting thing happening. And I don't, I don't understand what anyone is saying. Let's click my tip on it, please. One, two, one, two. Perfect. Three, four, five, six. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Now, wherever you go in the world, laughter is laughter in any language. And we all know how healing a good chuckle or good laugh is, especially when it comes from the belly, when you feel it right here. And this morning, we're joined by two comedians, uh, Lupe Lokodwa and Ntsika Skazo Longiningini. What do you guys as comedians find to be the quintessential difference between performing comedy in English and versus performing comedy in Vernac or your mother tongue? When you're performing in English, it's, uh, I don't know, I'm telling stories that Nobody knows, like in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when I do it in Tulsa, it's more like I'm telling them stories that they know. Vernac is Vernac, you understand? For us, we can understand each yeah. other without uh, speaking English in front of each other. Loving it, gentlemen, thank you so much. Good luck with the show. Go and check it out. It's a journey. So, yeah, right now, things are looking up. People are really kind of like really believing in what I'm doing. Everyone back home is watching, even my mom. Everybody, everybody. <laughs> it's exciting. For me, comedy is a form of giving. I am so blessed to be able to give these people so much to laugh at. You get people who tell you how much they were stressed until they saw you perform or until they saw your video. So as much as my comedy heals people, I must say that it helps me too. It is a blessing for me to see people laugh. It is a blessing for me to see people happy. It just makes me complete as a human being.
See you. 